an opinion. That's all. <laughs> I have a good friend that you all may know, and I say he's pretty old now, or Herb Kelleher, he's stoned Southwest Airlines. And he told me once that you never should let a, uh, the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> and he was very good at it. He was a successful one. <laughs> I should have got coffee. Do I have time to... Absolutely. Well, I don't know why I'm bothering to introduce him. I think he's a man who needs no introduction. But uh, if you haven't yet discovered, if you're here just because of my talking about it, because of the newsletter, uh, Bruce does a very interesting Saturday afternoon radio program on KTSA from 5 to 7. And lot's of fun stuff on his website, natureapproved.com is it? Net. Or .net. Okay, natureapproved.net. Only man I know with a pet buzzard. Only man I know with more uh, ducks running around than any other single landowner in Kendall County probably. And you also need, if you want to try some different good food periodically, Bruce does cooking demonstrations in various places, and you cook up everything from emu to buffalo to rattlesnake. I'm doing yak and kangaroo and python today. <laughs> so, is that all? I don't know what all he's going to talk about, but uh, he is going to inform us a little bit more about green living today. And so, I'll just turn it over to Bruce and let you go with it. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for coming, folks. If you haven't met me, that's it. I'm Bruce Dooley, and the only thing i got to remember is to tell KTSA I'm there 5 to 7 on Saturday afternoons. I started out trying to be a Bob Webster and doing gardening, but I, I, I don't fit there quite as well. Uh, the reason I did is, and a little different than Bob and his friend Howard, I, I've been sort of organic all my life by default. I didn't wait to be a chemico and then become an organiac. I have a twin brother, and we were in our maybe 12, I think we were 13, lived in South Georgia. Out walking, uh, in case you don't remember this, folks, for those of you that are older, in the old days there were no trespassing signs in the state of Georgia. As a matter of fact, there were no real fence walls. Okay? So if you want to go across someone's property, you sort of were allowed as long as you left it the way you found it. Don't leave. Then we didn't have cans of Coke to sit around. So we're crossing the field one morning and an airplane came over and sprayed us. He was spraying the field and we were walking to hunt frogs or something. Uh, my brother went into convulsion. My twin brother. And I ended up having to go get an ambulance and a lot of stuff. And I didn't realize even what was in that airplane at 12 years old. We'd been sprayed with God knows what, Nalfion or DDT or something. I mean, this would have been, golly, 60s, 62, 61. Something. And I got scared. I got frightened. And from that point on, I haven't trusted anything. My dad made a good sentence out of it. If you can't say it, you ought not to use it. <laughs> you got to read it and you got to say it's got four syllables, and you got to figure out how to say it. You probably shouldn't have it in your body. You probably shouldn't put it on your body. One of the things I'm going to talk about today, I usually use a computer, but there's so many things we can go into that I don't really need that for this setup, for sure. They've just discovered the number of toxins in makeup is unbelievable, and none of it's tested. Very small percentage. They're finding things in especially teenage girls' bodies beyond the limits that are even acceptable for them to become healthy mothers. When they get older. And now there's some new flags up. There's some new other organiacs that are looking into this. But, but if you think what you use is safe because the government said it was okay, then that's pretty naive. Don't trust what they got to say. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, is not here to protect you. It's here to protect Monsanto, Dow Chemical, ADM. Okay? And that's not what it's set up for. The Federal Drug Administration, you know where they get their test from? Does anybody know? They go to Dow Chemical and tell them, hey, you run the test and tell me if it's been good. You want to have the fox in the hen house? I mean, is that a way I want to test? I don't, under other countries like Europe in general, EU, the European Union now, they run independent tests and they don't let the product on the market till it's safe. We listen to the drug company and you and I are all guinea pigs. <laughs> We'll find out what DDT does to us. Let us use it 30 years. When the birds fall out of the sky and your bones are coming out of your body, hey, damn, DTA wasn't, wasn't a good idea to have DDT, was it? That's what they do with almost everything. This new big thing on bisphenol A. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? BPA. BPA is in most every plastic. 
It's in the liners of about 80% of all the cans you eat food out of. If you ever look in cans, remember the old days when a tin can had some tin in there? <laughs> and I don't know how good or bad that was for you, but that's what it was lined with. Open almost all your cans now, it looks like it's painted inside. It looks like someone painted your wall. Every one of those coatings that they've, just, that they've studied so far, now they can't say every one yet, has BPA, bisphenol A in it. And it's in 95 or 96% of all the bodies in America today. I've got it, he's got it, you've got it. It's not so bad as adults. We've gotten over that growth thing and we're just subsisting now. It's hell on fetuses. It's hell on pregnant women. Okay? You don't want to be around this stuff if you're going to be a, uh, a producing animal. And not just you, you actually your animals around you. And it's everywhere. What is that word? Insidious? I always say it wrong. It's, it's pervasive. We need to start watching that. Uh, I brought my coffee cup with me and I was so proud. Look around me, the number of people that have it. So coffee cups are the wrong way. I would recommend that they be uh, stainless lined because most of these plastics have a problem in them. But still beats the heck out of throwing away. I think someone said uh, uh, we're throwing away right now a billion now, not a million, a billion plastic bottles that carry water in them a week in the United States. 52 billion bottles a year, of which virtually none, a few percent, there is some that are supposed to be recyclable. And I do see people trying to recycle plastic in this bag, and, but three or four percent. 96 it goes into my compost bin. It really does. And that'll work. Yeah. It will go, except for the top. Right. Yeah. And we're changing all There's a number of cornstarch and soybean products and things that we can make <laughs> that is biodegradable. There's a lettuce company now I buy my organic veggies from when I don't have my own, and it says right on it, a corn product and it can be composted. Now, that's good. But you can't compost it at home. Where unless you, you actually have, oh, H-E-B and everybody has it. Just there's a couple of different organic lines they have, and I wish my brain's not working. The name is, you know, is one company that's doing it. But it says prominently on it that it's a biodegradable, non bisphenol a clear plastic. And it works perfectly. It's one of the few plastics that I still let my wife store things in. We have it left rather than throw it out. But what I want to get to is they infer, uh, they, yes, that, that you can compost it at home. Well, I've had it in there 90 days and it hasn't gone anywhere. The way of compost home is you actually have a heated compost pile like a garden bill would do or a landfill would do. Okay, so I still recommend those should go there. I guess if you would really run a thermophilic, like if you'd run a hot compost pile, I run a, a what I call static pile. I pile it there, and in four or five years I use it. <laughs> I got tired of turning things, and it doesn't break down. Anymore. So be aware that they are there, but they're not exactly as, as compostable as we think they ought to be. Unlike the plastics that we all are using, and I, yeah, number two, get one of these, or two or three or ten, and make yourself use it. Okay, I really promoted when I was on a, well, KAHL is gone, so I'll tell you. I got with a gal that was with HEV, and we introduced canvas bags. Whole Foods was already doing it, and we not forced them, but encouraged them to put canvas bags in 10 stores, 10 of their big stores. Now, I don't think there's an HEV that doesn't have available either the little 99 cent bag, which is okay too, or the 3.99 canvas bag. I hope there's no Whole Foods people here. They got theirs up for like 12 bucks. Now. I don't dislike Whole Foods, but they're a little wacky about some of them. Right? <laughs> wacky Mackey. Okay, John Mackey that runs it's going off the deep end sometimes. So go get your, if you want good food, go get the bag from H-E-B and then get your food up. You still get the discount. Jenny's has canvas bags for $1.99. And they're big. They're big and they're very sturdy. Good. I didn't know that. And I Target has them too. Well, I guess I think maybe the point of all this is, look what we've done. You know, you think people. a single person or a single group of us can't change things. Look around you and think about three years ago or five years ago. <coughs> the amount of food, even although I'm pretty disappointed sometimes with HEB, doesn't have. they got a heck of a lot of stuff. they get got 1,200 items the last time I talked to them that are certified organic. I'm going to turn that off. I'm are sorry. there new plastic, the green dollar bags, right. are those biodegradable? They're poly and they're pretty, the, the cool thing about them is, let me turn this off, uh, they're a hell of a lot better off than throwing plastic in. Or even, see I went from plastic to paper originally, 
because I can decompose the paper. But when you read, they have to use extra heavy glues, and they seldom use recycled paper. I don't know which is the better. So that's why when it says, you know, uh, paper or plastic, say neither. <laughs> I got my bag. Uh, Chico makes a bag. Look up Chico.com. C H I is from Chico, California. The bag. And I wish I'd brought mine because I usually carry it with me. It's this big. And it fits on your belt loop, guys, if you're a guy, and it'll go in any purse any woman carries. But it gets this big and carries 35 pounds. And you're never without a bag. Three bucks. I'm really considering getting enough to have 100 to give away and put organic matters on it, just to you know, brag on myself. I think it'd be worth a wow gift. When people call in or something, I'm really considering getting it. And, and uh, it's great to always have it with you. Mine's in the car because I don't have to wear the clothes I'm wearing. Ordinarily, I'm not dressed like this. I have a, you know, some weak old shorts <laughs> in the back hanging from me. So anyway, I, I guess what I want to get you to, to look at today is a general overview of what is being green. When I started the organic radio show, and I've been listening to Bob for years before I did my own show, and how what I've known, uh, it was very important that I planted my stuff. I'm a terrible gardener in a lot of ways. I put a lot of stuff out there, and what survives, I eat. Well, that's not a very organized way to garden, but it's the truth. Okay? But I only have my wife and I, and I have uh, 80 ducks, and they get a lot more than I do. And it, it's, I, I survive. I think I'm, I'm a, an original third world person. I actually have a decent house on the front of the ranch, and I don't live in it. I live in a cabin we built out of used material. It's 360 square feet. It's what? This room is probably... 250. <laughs> oh, but you have a nice back porch. But I, yeah, and I live on the back porch. Yeah. But, but I, I think what I try to get people to look at is, yes, you grow organic vegetables. And it, this is a story I don't know if I've told on the air, but it's true. I was up at a man that grows herbs in Kerrville, Texas, several years ago. Very expensive herbs, where they cut them with scissors and put them in little bags and sell them to chefs. I, I used to call them truck farms or something. I don't know what he called them that. But he had greenhouses for all this stuff. And it was pretty herbs. And I went to get esp epizote. Do you know what epizote is? Anybody? Yeah. You know what it's for? You know how to tell them? <laughs> <laughs> it's bean lovers. <laughs> it, yeah, it makes beans easier to tolerate from your neighbors. But anyway, and it's also a good herb. So I went to get it. And he shows me his greenhouse. A very nice man. Won't use his name. And then invites me in to have a glass of wine, which he knows. I make my own. And, and we're there about three minutes, and he said, hey, we need to go outside and sit on the porch. I didn't know why he said that. So I went out, glass porch, glass doors, so I had to sit. And I look in his house, and the orchid man sprayed. Just a guy running around with these things that you carry, spraying the interior of his home. Well, I fell on comfortable, but about three wines later, <laughs> I finally says, wait a minute, you're growing certified organic herbs. You've got this gorgeous place where you won't even let pesticides come in, and the orchid man spray. Well, I call him the orchid man, I don't know who the hell it was. He spray your house. And you could see, I thought he was going to be no, unhappy with me, might be the term, because he is a good friend. You could see a light bulb come up. And he said, well, it came with the house. And we bought the house, they had the contract, and we haven't had any bugs. So we've just let that guy come for two years, once every three or four months. <laughs> I mean, is that short-sightedness? Does that make sense that the man was so aware of how to grow things that, well, he wanted to make money on them. Let's first say, maybe he wasn't organic, but he knew he needed to be to make money. But he didn't have a thought that his kids and his cats and his wife and him are breathing this stuff. And it's there. I mean, it keeps bugs down. Why? Three months? Because, damn it, it lasts three months. You know, I have to tell you, in our old days, before we knew better, we had the guy come and spray. We stopped that probably 12 years ago. We still find dead quivering roaches. That's what I was going to say. My dad, the same thing. The, the guy came once a month, and we still find the, the dead water roaches. It was mm -hmm. back in 98. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, anyway, I put him on an organic program, which I didn't even think about. It. I just told him what he should use. Go get his own sprayer. And buy organic whatever around then, but, but how to make a, a basic concoction, orange oils and the things we use. And I did get to go back, of course, several months. Right? He says, I don't have any more bugs than I had. He says, it takes me 30 minutes, you know, once a month or doing it. And it says, it works every bit as good or better. And he just couldn't imagine. First, what he was spending, because I am tight, folks. And secondly, it, it was just poisoning his own home. Do you have a recipe for that on your... Website? Oh, yeah, it's in my web, it's in okay. that book, and everybody's got okay. it. They're pretty common. Right now, if you're too lazy to do it, 
Probably bioorganic could be a pretty safe thing you could use. That's when you think spinosad. Spinosad is I, I personally think in the house that the bioorganic might be better. Spinosad is uh, yeah. Greenlight did some tests and they found it was still killing root roaches two to four weeks after you used it. This is which bioorganic. Bio 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 combination of herb oil, sesame yeah, oil, and thyme oil. That's what I use. I didn't know there was last that long. Yeah. Well, they're not as long as these six months of the year, which I don't want. Yes, ma'am. My floors are real wood. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what laminate is. But I don't see any staining or anything if that's yeah, what you're asking. Like that. Yeah, no, no. I, I would the orange oil might scare me more. Yeah, that's orange oil is yeah. pretty uh, <coughs> pretty dilute though. Well, it's it's very dilute. Dilute. Yeah. It, it yeah. comes in at two or three percent and then you put so many ounces. I mean it's it's amazing at what low level it works and that we've been so nearsighted to use these poisons when when this stuff's been available for decades. Um, we used it along our molding, which are a bamboo yeah. product, and there's been no staining. Good. Good. Yeah, Finish. but it is a dark finish on ours. But if it was going to react, it would have done something. Good question, but of course test it like you do if you're going to do something on a carpet. Take a corner somewhere that's blind and, and do it and see, but it, it works. A lot of other things, you know, have for you, roaches. Have you uh, heard anything bad or good about uh, mixing the spinosa and the bioorganic? Hadn't come up with it. Have you heard it about? I don't know that it would do now. If it would do any good or any bad, but I don't know that it would it be a, does good. an inner reaction of any kind that would bother me. Well, it might scare me is no, I think it'd be okay. I, I can't give you an honest answer there because I haven't done it. ABC Pest Control does what they call an organic spraying. Right. Is that really organic? Is they do it okay? what they call chem free. Chem free. Mm -hmm. It's not organic. Okay. It is chem free. <clears throat> They always use lower toxicity products. For instance, for roach control, they use something called orthoboric acid. Not organic, but it's a heck of a lot better than diazinon or malathion or what some of the other folks are still using. But no, it's, it's not organic. Because I have an, an ant infestion up in my attic areas, mm -hmm. and I can't get up there and spray around. So would they be okay to use? Probably the closest thing we got. Here in this They're what expensive. Kind of, what kind of ants? Uh, Carpenter ants? Just those great ones that guns? come out of holes in the ceiling. I don't know. Okay, they're, well that, they're good. They're not they that will, They will take some of that uh, bait, the fire ant bait with the spinosa in it. They will? I just got rid of some in the, in the wall. Well, my problem is getting up and getting yeah, into these Yeah, hire places. someone to do it is what you're saying. Yeah. Um, they also charge a lot more for it than their chemical one because mm -hmm. they say they have to clean their equipment before they can come out. Well, so they, they should be using they different might equipment. Get yes, yeah. from yeah. What the the aspartame asked. and orange juice makes a pretty good bait for killing uh, yeah. carpenter ants. How many people it's killed? I do that for <laughs> sugar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mentioned uh, wine. Why are there so few organic wine, there's so few organic wines on the market. Are the non-organic wines like the France, Napa, are they concentrated on insecticides? Not so much concentrated, okay? That's not the big scare. The first thing you do about wine, you may not be aware of. Uh, the Fetzer Corporation, which makes reasonably cheap wine, is, is uh, 200 of their orchards right now are certified organic. And they've given the other people they buy grapes from until 2010 to be organic, but they're not buying grapes from them anymore. Now, I, I talked to someone at Fetzer, and they actually put out an organic wine that said organic wine. It wouldn't sell. Now, this was a few years ago. So, they haven't promoted organic because, believe it or not, the winos of the world, my exception being me, uh, seem to have some negative idea that if it's grown organic, it's not as good a wine. Well, that's first proving not to be true at all. And secondly, Fetzer has now announced publicly that they're going to have all organic juices. Now, the big surprise to me was I just learned this week, even though the, I want to use the word, the wino gallo company, which just makes really cheap wine, Believe it or not, folks, they're all natural and soon to be organic. Most California growers are. Yes. Like you said, we, we saw a bunch of them at a convention one time. Majority of them were organic, but wouldn't admit it. Mm -hmm. For just the reason you're saying, because it would be perceived as being too far out there. So there are a lot more organic wines than you they're realize, they're but they're not labeled that way. Well, well Fetzer sold out, and their family has opened another one, which right now is escaping me. It starts with a B. Uh, and it's very common here. You can get it at Boche H&M. It's also an organic... What? 
uh, bioorganic. I mean, there's no herbicides, no pesticides. I don't know that they. I, they use the word. I like this. They biodynamic, and they do put that in the. Uh, the biodynamics really interesting. What about like in France and Italy? I understand that in Italy, and, and I get this from Sandy Oaks, the Sandy Oaks Olive Orchard, they're already basically organic because they don't allow the crap that we use. So even the olive oils and things that come from Italy are pretty sick. They're like um, uh, or New Zealand lamb. If you want lamb that you know is pretty clean, I hate to push these people, but uh, what does uh, Walmart own? Sam's? They have a lamb there for six fifty a pound. That is absolutely beautiful from New Zealand, sealed in New Zealand, and I know about New Zealand, and there's no, that's going to be a pretty safe meat to eat. Now, while we're on meats, because I am going to wander here today, um, I'm really down on commercial meat more than ever. There's more and more things coming along with this E. coli scares and the uh, salmonellas and the shigellas, and to an um, to animal right now. They're all from Franken farms. We have not had an organic cow with mad cow disease. They have not even had grass-fed, grass-finished cow with mad cow disease. None. It's not curing it by all the legislation they want or wanting to check every cow, which may not be a bad idea. What they need to do is change the paradigm of how the heck we raise our food, not just our meat. Look at our spinach scares. Look at our lettuce scares. Everyone was from mass-produced. You can't how do I do this? If you put too many fish in the aquarium, the fish are sick. You can't take 4,000 cows and put them on 500 acres and expect them to be healthy. You're asking for a primordial soup to produce God knows what. It's just a stupid idea. You know that New Zealand doesn't do that. Even Australia doesn't do that. We talk about, about um, uh, Argentina beef. And everybody says, oh, it's, it's great beef. They're grass-fed beef, folks. They don't put them in cattle lots and feed them corn. How oh, many of y'all have listened to me? You know what happens when you feed corn to a cow? His pH in his stomach goes down to pretty much match ours. They usually have a pretty high pH. So then a, a Mr. E. coli comes along and he infects this cow and then they, the way they mass butcher, the cow breaks open while the meats are going by and some of this stuff gets on the meats. And you've got an E. coli there, especially 0157, that is very virulent to us. Take that same cow, leave him on grass, still screw up the butcher. <laughs> Bust him open, the things get on the meat, whether they tell you or not. But you know what? That, old one, that, that, that E. coli that was in that cow's stomach can't stand the pH of the acids in our stomach. We've set ourselves up to get ourselves sick. It doesn't make sense that once we know that, that we can sit, continue this paradigm. Now, the answer is they want to feed all of us all the beef we want. Well, folks, I'm a big meat eater. By God, most of us eat too much meat. My answer is pay more, get organic, get less, and make it better for you. Spend the extra two bucks a pound. Uh, one thing I would recommend, don't buy any hamburger, even if it's organic. If you want hamburger, grind your own. Think of what happens when you take a meat with ordinary, let's just say it has a scant amount of something on it, E. coli or something, and then you grind it up, you aerate it, you mix it all together, you've made yourself a... a bacterial study to eat. <laughs> you see, and you let it sit for a day or two if you get in a pack, and they multiply, good bugs multiply every 20 or 30 minutes. You got a lot of bacteria. You want a question? Right, I've read reports about how they put the gas in the, uh, the meat packaging. Carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Right, now what are they, are they also irradiating meat now? There's a number of meats, there's another couple of things going on. Yes, a lot of meats are irradiated and they don't even tell us. If we've got a problem with the government right now, does everybody know that they just okayed GM without us having it on the package. Now it's not there yet because they're still pretty, but the, the government this very way, well actually last week, we're going to be the only, I want to use the word civilized, although I question that sometimes, the only civilized nation that is not going to tell us that you've got genetically modified products and give me a choice. You know they did that with almonds. Thank God this week 10 almond growers are now suing the government to force them to stop irradiating and gassing our almonds because five years ago there were two or three cases of almonds that gave people salmonella because they were mishandled. Why? Because they're mass farmed. None of them were organic and yet they're forcing us our raw organic almonds are no longer raw and organic. So we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot 
uh, what are we going to do if, the, if what we call USDA organic is no longer trustworthy? Who else are we going to trust? <coughs> they, keep, they keep messing with us. The big guys keep moving in. There's a big fight right now with Horizon Dairies. Anybody drink Horizon organic milk? Well, it's not organic. <laughs> it doesn't pass any test to be an organic. They're, they're, they've been buying cows that are not raised properly. They've been using drugs they're not supposed to raise. They have been heating or and irradiating milk when they're not supposed to. And they've been caught. And they had their hands slapped. But they, right now, are still in business. And, and we don't know when and if they're ever going to change it. So a number of these companies, like Walmart, buy their milk from Horizon Dairy. And uh, I don't buy their organic milk. Of course, I buy raw milk anyway, which they say also. They just try to make that illegal in California. Raw milk will kill you. All of us over 50 in this room had raw milk when we were growing up. I didn't die. I mean, it, the milk is as good as the cow and the dairy that produces it. And it's safe as any other milk you can drink. Now, there's, I just read The Paleo Diet by uh, Cornette. Cornette. He says you shouldn't drink any milk. I don't know if I agree with you. Do you know the Paleo Diet? Does that give you a definition of what this is? This is what the cavemen eat before we grew grain. I mean, that, probably a longer definition. And there's some real, there's some real uh, validity to this. We've been here, and I don't know numbers, I wouldn't even tell you, but we've only been eating grain and civilized food for about 4 or 5% of the time man's been on earth. The other 96% of the time, we mostly ate vegetables, fruits in season, and anything we could kill. That's why I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian. Uh, I can go into all the science of the body you want, but I don't know that it's bad to be. But I also know, you know, one of Joan Goodall's great studies was how many monkeys chimpanzees eat a week. They get together in packs and run these monkeys down and they eat every ounce of the meat. So even though we think they are herbivores, they need the protein. Okay? So I, I want, I'm kind of doing paleo. I'm not a carb guy. I don't eat. I eat a little bread. My wife makes some bread from raw wheat that we have occasionally. But I'm saying, and it seems to work for me. I don't gain any weight. I don't lose any weight. I, can't, I really never get sick. I'm never, I'm pretty sick, but I mean, I'm never. <laughs> and, and, uh, you get plenty of grape sugar. Mm -hmm. Grape sugar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do that. I, well, I, the fermentation is good. Fermentation, sauerkraut, wine, uh, uh, kimchi, if you like it. There's some real magic to fermented things. Uh, another new study that's, I don't know if I've done on radio or not, is the amazing study on turmeric. Does anybody eat curry besides me? Oh, yeah. Curry. Oh, yeah. curry is uh, mostly because of the turmeric, although they're looking at some of the other ingredients. It's almost, you know when you have one of these silver bullets, it's too good to be true? Right now, this stuff's proving to be almost a silver bullet for the health of the body. Incorporate turmeric in what you're eating. Learn to do it. I always hear Howard Garrett talking about his famous teas every morning. Well, I've gotten into doing this especially because I... First, I'm going to tell you one other job I do that y'all know. I'm currently reading books for a living. I Sign read audio up. books. I just sent four more chapters to Acres USA. And I get up in the morning and I read two or three or four chapters. Right now I'm doing Malcolm Beck's books. But my voice is awful when I'm at best. <laughs> in the morning, it's pretty rotten. I've been making tea with cayenne and turmeric and garlic in a base of, uh, you're going to love this, in a base of bouillon that I made from the bones of the deer. I boil it down and keep it as a broth, and then I heat it and put it on it. You wouldn't believe how great my voice works after that. Run my nose a little bit. <laughs> you bring yes. cinnamon, yes. that's why. <laughs> cinnamon be great. I use cinnamon. In, yeah, I put cinnamon and chocolate in my coffee real organic chocolate and cinnamon. Uh, one cup a day of my coffee that I drink has that in it. Teaspoon of cinnamon a day? Yeah, yeah, I don't quite get that. Yeah. Uh -oh. I mean, I don't get that Put much. Put that in your oatmeal. Yeah, I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do oatmeal. But anyway. Anywhere else y'all want to go before I wander through so this? One quick thing about uh, milk. What do you think of the promised land milk? You know, I know who they are, and I don't think it's bad. Uh, I just don't, again, if I had my brothers, I would only drink raw whole milk, mm -hmm. and I drink very little milk. I actually get a, a gallon every week or 10 days from Delphine Beck. A lady comes from East Texas and brings us about 30 gallons every couple of weeks with the cream on it directly from where milk comes from. 
So you have to go out to Garden I have to, to go and do it. Well, I'm always there every week or 10 days oh. anyway. And pick it up. And that's all the milk I use. Now, my wife has tried Promised Land, and she drinks all these weird process. Uh, maybe you should go here now. Fox, if it's processed, you probably ought not to eat it. Okay. Do you own part of the cow? Do I own part of the cow? Oh, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. I have yeah. to be a member. In Texas, it's not quite as bad as California. But in order to get raw milk, you have to be a member of the cow. <laughs> I don't know what part I own. I have some preferences. <laughs> but but, but uh, I own some piece of that cow so that I can have some of her milk. Now, I think that's ridiculous. But in California, they literally made it what's almost impossible. Now, they're, they're trying to change the law again. And a number of states, you can't buy raw milk with that. Now, I don't know where the government that doesn't even protect me from Durzban or BPAs when they know they're bad, or Teflon, which we'll get into in a minute, we're going to talk a little bit about cooking utensils, then they're protecting me from drinking cow's milk. Where is the lobby here? What is going on? What do you mean I can't drink wild cow's milk? Probably some lobby. It's hmm? probably a lobby uh, Oh, no, issue. there's bound to be. What about soy milk? Uh, okay, first of all, if you can get to it, it doesn't scare me too bad. It's very good, too. 63 or 65% of all the soy in America is now GM. We basically are eating all genetically modified soy. So that's one thing I don't like about soy. The other thing, and since a lady asked, I'll do exactly, soy evidently ain't good for you when you're post menopause. It's, uh, post menopausal woman really shouldn't be drinking soy stuff or eating soy products. It is a true pseudo estrogen, and it may increase some breast cancer problems, some cervical cancer problems. And I mean, it's significant. We're not just saying they made a guess. There's been some studies. So I'm not anti soy per se. As a matter of fact, I make some firm tofu, tofu and bake it once a month and fry it and use it. But uh, I, my wife doesn't eat it, and I've decided it's probably not a smart idea. I think we've overdone the health benefits of. Well, of any one food. There's no superfoods out there, even though I talked about turmeric. I had thyroid cancer mm -hmm. a few years ago, and doing some research, I found out that there's sort of a link between that and soy consumption. Mm -hmm. And also, the other thing is, is it the shell or the uh, on the soybean mm -hmm. is really hard, and there's a chemical they have to use to soften it to get the soybean out of that. It's chemical. It's like making canola. Yeah. I was telling anybody that the healthiest oils are olive oil and canola and some. Someone, go on the web and Google canola and read what they take to make that oil. <laughs> it is got, it, the, my dad's rule comes back. If you can't say it, don't eat it. They use chemistry. I don't even know what it is. Now, you can get first cold pressed canola oil. That's what I use when I want canola. And it's four times more expensive. But that's what I get. I'm a big olive oil guy. Come on, guys. Olive oil is my staple for my oils. But I also use oils nobody else thinks you should buy them, um, except Sally Fallon. Um, I use coconut. Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. first cold pressed coconut oil because it's very high temp use. Mm -hmm. If you want super high temp, the highest oil temp you can get, period, is avocado oil. Mm -hmm. It does start breaking down to 510 degrees. Now, why don't we want our oils to break down? Because we're turning them into trans fats. We're saying we don't want trans fats. If you over, if you start, the one thing I, I like to cook in a wok. And I got this great video from this Oriental guy that has these giant. I have a, I have a 22 inch stainless steel wok. You can cook a small kid in it. It's huge. Okay. And 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 but he tells you not to throw anything in there till it's smoking. That's the way he thinks it has to work. Well, folks, when you're smoking oil at the smoke point, you're breaking down all the biology of that oil. Any good that might be there is gone. Number one. There might be some bad stuff in there. Don't overcook anything. If you're going to cook steak to well done, which I don't agree, you do it slower, you get over this idea that it's got to have black marks on it. That's carcinogenic, folks. You're breaking down that stuff in nitrosamines that you don't want to eat. Someone said a really black cooked steak had about as much nitrosamine and damage as a whole pack of cigarettes. It's not a good thing. Yes, ma'am. What about grapeseed oil? I like it, and it's medium to, it's a little lower heat than I thought, but no, it's perfectly good oil. I would make sure it's organic, because well, grapes are really treated. Organic. I can find a Napa Valley, when you were talking about California mm -hmm. grapeseed oil, sure. I don't, I, I look uh, You, you need to flirt foods. with um, uh, the health food stores have gotten very, they used to just be pill boxes. Now they're carrying organic grapeseed, organic sesame oil, well, first cold-pressed canola, 
uh, my favorite extra virgin organic olive oil. Uh, Sun Harvest would have some, at least one brand, probably. Whole Food. I have a real problem since, again, I'm not advertising for Whole Foods right now. I hope that Mackey's turning the other way. He had really, he's gotten so commercialized for me that I'm not as happy with Whole Foods as I used to be. He's, he still wants to go local, and he, but he's not doing a good job. Uh, if y'all listened to my show a few weeks ago, I went in, and I, I can tell you here, I didn't tell on the air who it was. I went to Whole Foods. And I went through 37 products with the 365 brand on it. I always kind of thought 365, their home brand, kind of meant it was natural at least, or organic, or local. Some. Of that 37 different cans that I looked at, 23 of them were from China. Oh. Now, not only were from China, the most, <coughs> the most deceptive one that I had was in big, bold print. I said, this is good. California-style mixed beans. It said California's. California-style. Fresh from China. Made in China was in, I don't even know what number this is. One point type, is that what that is when you can't read it without an extra magnifying glass, even if you have eyes? That's how it said made in China. But uh, over half was made in China, or maybe I should align a little bit. Some was in Indonesia and a couple other places. But less than half of them were from the United States of America. Now, I'm very global. I love everybody. I, uh, what I'm worried about is the problems we're having from China. This very week it came out that the plant, a number of the things we're eating from China has melamine in it. Mm -hmm. melamine. All those children got sick from the milk. Yeah, the, died, yeah, the, well, there was a real danger 10, of baby stuff especially. But now they're starting to look into this and a number of these things uh, have got melamine and, and that's <clears> poisonous <throat> to us. Okay, now, I'm not sure what a melamine plate does. My mom used to have, I don't know if that breaks down. But in finite nanoparticles, this stuff's not good for your body. You talk about cooking, you recommend like uh, cast iron and stainless steel. Now, yes. what about uh, anodized carbon steel? Yeah, uh, anodized, I've got uh, my, my personal views out on. Evidently, it wouldn't break down at 1,600 degrees, but most of us shouldn't be cooking at 1,600 degrees. <laughs> okay, so it's not so scary. Now, there's a new one out just came out and they haven't made any fanfare about it yet because they still want you to buy their Teflon. But DuPont has now gone to a thing called Thermalon. And it really is with no PFOA. It doesn't have all the bad stuff we know. There's some things we're still looking at because there is a silicon base, a silicone base, and some other things that we're not. It's too new to know, you know what I mean, when you get in a whole new chemical makeup. But at this moment, if I had to have non-stick, which I don't, then I'd be sure that it said Thermalon, T-H-E-M-O-L-O-N. And what it is, is they've been instructed to get out of the Teflon business by 2015. I don't know if you all know that story or not, but they had the largest fine ever fined against one chemical company when they found out they'd been dumped in 60 or 80,000 pounds of PFOA in the Mississippi River for 20 years. Okay, and then the scientist that did the studies on originally on Teflon, when he retired, he sent an 1,100-page document to Congress or to somebody in, in uh, government and said, hey, we knew this stuff wasn't good for you 30 years ago. They suppressed my, I guess it was, you know, when you don't make, be right with God when you're dying. <laughs> he wanted to make it straight. And that's when Love this whole Teflon scare came in and they decided to get us away from Teflon. So what do you use instead of Teflon? Learn to season it. I can tell you how it's very simple. Used properly, it never sticks. I mean, literally never sticks. It's good for you as far as we can find so far. I'm a little nonplussed that even the second largest maker or the seller in the nation now is Camp Chef, number one's Lodge. Camp Chef just moved all their cast on facilities to China. They've been making it in Utah since 1896. 1896. Second oldest Lodge is even older. And Lodge is the only, the only foundry left in America making cast iron. So even though it's a few more bucks, they don't, I got to admit, I got old Camp Chef before they changed. Thank God. They make some pots and things that Lodge doesn't make that are really good. They actually make a 28-pound convection cast iron oven that is really cool. But Lodge hadn't gotten that far. Bruce, yes. case logic, if, or case if you uh, go online, mm -hmm. you can subscribe to the case newsletter. And they frequently have coupons and all or discounts available online. This is CASE like the knife case? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, Lodge, sorry. Oh, okay, Lodge, yeah. Well, I actually am a, and I, I won't order one for y'all unless you want to get a pallet. They've actually even made me a dealer, and I've ordered a few pallets of it to myself and Gibson's and Kerrville split them and things. And they've been very good to me. They help me go do some of my shows. I've been to their foundry. I, I like Lodge a what lot. What about the Lodge Logic? For people who just started out and aren't familiar or comfortable yeah. with seasoning their own thing. Well, what they've done is they super season their own cast iron now. And I know the procedure, and I can't see anything wrong with it, but uh, what I should have been, the, what is it, born in Missouri, the show me state. Uh, they, they heat this stuff up to like 800 degrees, and they use a special veg vegetable based oil, and they impregnate this. Oh, I just cast iron with it, and then they quick cool it, and they do this a number of times, and it supposedly, and it does indeed super season it. I don't see anything, but I have to question 800 degree vegetable oil. Yeah. I just have to question what we're doing to that oil when we break it down that way. Any enamel cast iron? Like Very good. The only problem with enamel cast iron is, believe it or not, there's some enamel cast iron coming out of China with some stuff in it you don't want to eat. But Le Creuset is the French. Le Creuset is good. Now what they've done is kind of scary, and you, if you, if you've been to the Le Creuset or Le Creuset uh, discount house in San Marcos, it's not the same pot. Mm -hmm. Read the pot. They are now making stuff in China and in other countries, keeping their name on it. Your mom goes and buys a $200 pot, and you say, Mom, I got mine for $69 on the web. So you turn the bottom over, and this one's made in France, and this one's made in China. A number of companies are going so, so do know what you're buying. I use palm oil. I use palm kernel oil. Let me get you, let's do oils a minute. Almost all natural oils, natural pig fat, is good for you in limited quantity. Uh, a tablespoon of grease or oil is 120 calories. I don't care what else you do with it. I don't care where it came from. It's basically about a So if you can eat, you know, 14 different kinds of grease fatty foods every day and fry it at 400 degrees, you're going to kill yourself. But if you need sesame oil, the grapeseed oil, you want a flavor, you want a neutral oil, you want a super high heat oil that doesn't break down, use some oil. We need oil. Our bodies, our brains won't work without oil. We, we actually need uh, oleic acids and omega-3s and 6s. Now the problem in America is it's all backwards. Your threes and sixes should be balanced. The average American's eating about nine times more six than he is three. That's why you see all these omega-3 supplements, because we're screwed up. If we were eating buffalo on the hoof, fish out of an ocean instead of out of a farm pond or a you know, farm there, uh, guess what? The threes and sixes are in balance. Eggs from chickens that you have to like me. Uh, he's talking about my bird. Do you know how I find chicken eggs? I get up real early and listen for the chicken. And they make this cackle in their little egg, and then I go steal some eggs. <laughs> they're not in a pen. They're only free. They're wild. If I want to eat a chicken, I need a 22. <laughs> I can't go get them any other way. You can ask. I have a question about meat. I sure. Have, well, I've read, like most people here, I guess, read one too many scary food books. Sure. And um, how, I have, have trouble finding pasture-fed beef that isn't ground in any source, actually. Mm -hmm. I can't find them in stores. And they, they, they're, they're very quick to say no growth hormones, but nobody says pasture finished or pasture raised. Well, and, not, and even if they did, yeah. there's no definition. The government doesn't care. When you say uh, uh, Tyson Chicken just got through a $4 million problem, because they had all natural on their chickens. No hormones, no antibiotics, all natural. You ever seen how Tyson Chicken's raised? The only thing natural about it is it's heart beats. They're raised in little tiny cages, and the reason they didn't get away with it is they actually do feed them an antibiotic. But because the antibiotic supposedly had no effect on human beings, they didn't have to report it. Well, somebody bought, didn't buy that, and now they spent, the reason it was four million bucks is they spent like a million and a half and had to pull all their chickens back and re repackage them because the package was a lie. So the choice was either throw them out or repackage them. And, and, and all natural doesn't mean anything. Grass fed. Yeah. Um, Horizon says that their dairy cows are uh, free range grass fed. Uh, there's photographs you can go on the internet and see shot from airplanes out towards Lubbock, Texas, and there's about, I don't know, a thousand cows on 50 acres of land. 
If they're grass fed, somebody got the last blade. <laughs> Way before they shot this photo. Tell them about your friend with the exotic meats. I know that's not. Yeah, I have a friend named Russ McCurdy that was in 15 years in Oregon. I always took I cook all this weird stuff. And he moved here to Texas because he's big at market, biggest markets here in Texas. And it's very interesting. He only has sustainable meats. He only has really grass fed, grass finished. You know, by definition, not just because it's said it. Uh, he's got a lot of really exotic stuff. It is not inexpensive. I'll tell you that right now. But for a difference in text, for some really good balance, I mean, yak's the best meat, red meat I think I've ever eaten, or one of the best. All a yak is is a shaggy cow. But because they've evolved in very cold country, the marbling only goes between the skin and the meat instead of in the meat. So you get enough grease. It's not completely dried out. But this, uh, the USDA says the more marbling the steak is, the higher value it is. Not for life. <laughs> it might be that our palate likes that little greasy feel because we're so used to it. But it sure as heck isn't. And what it should say, USDA should say, this is the healthiest meat. Now this is the, but they don't. Health doesn't come into play in, in grading meat in the United States of America. Period. Uh, yes? Is there not an exotic meat store here on That's him. That's him. He's right there between Nacogdoches and 410. You're welcome in there on retail. Uh, he's got about 30 freezers with different meats in them all the time. Uh, we've had everything from bear to python to lion to a number of things. Now, I'm an organiac and a tree hugger, okay? So I have some problems at first. But, for instance, the bear. Who knew? Why would you have bear? Because they're domestically raised, they've been raised here for years in one acre pens with tops on them. They're herbivores, they don't feed them any meat. And they sell their gallbladder and a few of the organs inside that bear to China for more money than the bear's worth and they were throwing the meat away. Or making it into dog food. So, McCurdy finds out about this and just committed, because they only do eight or ten bears a year. I mean, I think the gallbladder in American money is 1200 1500 bucks for a little piece of bear, because they think it's, how do I do this? <laughs> it's good for your uh, uh, arbor. Is that a good term? It's or they libido. think it's. Libido. Libido. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they were buying the bear parts and leaving the bear. So now he has the bear processed, and, and it, <coughs> I'm from South Georgia, it ain't bad meat. Now remember, it's totally herbivore. There's no meat going into the meat. I don't know if that matters, but I mean, it may not taste like wild bear. If nobody's ever actually had wild bear, it may be awful, I don't know. But herbivore bear ain't bad. It's $58 a pound. How much you want me to bring you? We don't go on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> what about Buddy's chicken? Is it good bad? I've been to Buddy's a couple of times. It's, it's, uh, it's a far cry above Tyson's. But I still think it's Frankenfarm by my definition. They're still in little pens and they're still really not out running around. They do not use, as to my knowledge, unless they lie to me, uh, hormones, uh, arsenic. You know that all the chickens you're buying here have arsenic in them. They give every chicken that's commercially raised right now arsenic. Because it keeps infection down, it keeps bacteria down, and the chicken grows faster. Unfortunately, you get to eat the arsenic. Arsenic is, uh, doesn't go away. It's persistent. Yeah, it's a persistent, uh, yeah. So I don't buy any chickens. This is why my place looks like third one. When I want a chicken, I literally have to. Matter of fact, I'm not much of a hunter. So my brother brought, my brother's a sheriff that just retired. He made me a little 22, And he bought a uh, $20 laser that you get on a BB gun. And he mounted it on this 22. This is terrible, I'll tell you. So when I want a chicken, but I don't want to hurt it, see. I mean, I want to hurt it, but I don't want, for one thing, I don't want to scare it. I think meat you run for an hour is not as good for it as meat that just didn't know it existed in a minute. All you have to do to shoot this chicken is put this red dot on its head. You don't have to aim or nothing. Just watch the dot. And it works perfect every time. Unless you want to eat chicken brains, I guess, but I know. But it works so quick. And then I, 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 I got so bad about this that I bought my own duck plucker. I have an electric duck plucker. I got so sick of pulling feathers, this thing's got a bunch of fingers on it, a big motor, and you take that bear and go, and it goes, and, and the feathers are gone in about a minute and a half. That's great. What do you yeah, do with uh, the feathers? Uh, uh, I mean, compost them. Feathers, it's good. They're very high in, uh, in nitrogen. 
Yeah. He makes his pillows out of them. I have made pillows. My wife keeps them down when we have blue pillows. She got lazy. But yeah, we do do. I mean, I am not about this, folks. But I and not everybody can do that. But if you even have a small piece of property, you can raise a lot of vegetables. You can even raise a few birds. There's a there's a chicken available that doesn't cluck. And Muscovy ducks. The loudest noise in Muscovy ducks is just blah, 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 blah. And the males go, shh, shh. They hiss at each other. There's no quacking that we think of. You could live in downtown Alamo Heights. Which he did. Which I did. <laughs> I lived which on Tuxedo. Have, I, have you heard this story? I live on Tuxedo. 244 Tuxedo, right in the middle of the 09er district. Two houses down is a friend of mine, David McKelvey, which is the bird man. <clears throat> Between us, we had 400 birds. Of which a bunch were chickens. But we had roosters and people kept complaining. They were fussing at us. So we went to Dr. used to be on KTSA, no, Vice. We go to Tom Vice. Go over there one day with us. This is a terrible story. We took a few chickens with us, some extra chickens. Said, Tom, we want to devoice the rooster. Well, he practiced on a few of the hens so he could go in there and find out where the little. And we ate the hens incidentally. We don't waste anything. Then he took a needle, put the, the rooster to sleep, and he stirred up his, I guess it would be larynx. I don't know if that's what it is in a bird or not. He just completely dilated, uh, what do you call it? Just annihilated <laughs> this, this chicken's voice box. So then, chicken got better, no problem. Every morning you'd see him out there on the post between McKelvin and I going, Whew. <laughs> Don't make any noise. But he didn't know. He didn't bother the chicken at all. Right? So time goes by, he's our favorite rooster because he can breed everybody and not make any noise and the neighbors quit calling the police. <laughs> Except about a year goes by and one morning I get up my hair. And like three months later, the damn thing was louder than ever. <laughs> it got its box, a hundred dollar box or whatever vice charged us, came back to the rooster after about a year. <laughs> Pretty bad. Huh? Regenerated. <laughs> Regenerated. This is off the rooster subject. Well, it's probably about time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty serious subject. Okay. Middle class and well to do people mm -hmm. can't afford to be a guy. Say again. No. Middle class mm -hmm. and upper class mm -hmm. can afford to be a guy. What do we do about all the people who are in lower class and just can't afford these things? First, you're right. Total dollar wise. But let me give you a bit of a defense and then we'll, we'll answer that alone. We think we can't afford to be organic. Right now, it's gone up from about, and I'm going to guess the numbers, folks, 37 to 40 percent, up to about 50 percent right now, of the disposable income of the average Mexican is to buy food every day to feed their family. Because of the corn, we're feeding, folks, we're feeding food to, to a gas tank, which is a stupid idea. I'm not saying we don't have to have, I love biofuels and I want to learn how to do it. But corn is not the answer. Corn was up to over $7 a bushel at one time and it was $1.60. And we're still subsidizing. Do you all know we still subsidize corn with your dollars? We guarantee every stock and if that corn fails, even though it's up to 7 bucks a bushel, you and I pay that farmer. Something sick about that to begin with. So where I'm going with this is we pay 11 to 12 percent of our income to eat in the United States. That's pretty low. It's the lowest in, America, in, the, in the world. Canada was lower than us by a percentage or two, and they some way have jumped a little bit ahead of us. So it is a very disposable thing. Now, to go to the really poor people, uh, they're probably going to spend 30% of their income. But I still don't know that, that we can't, as we move along, and this has already happened. Right now, you can buy organic celery for 30 cents more a set than, than conventional. It's changed a lot. Yes, but across the board. Yes, across the board, it's, board, it's still very expensive. And to, to feed a balanced diet to your four kids mm -hmm. when you're on disability mm -hmm. or down there is impossible. Right. Pretty, and how, pretty do, much. how do we solve that problem? We can't just say the rich and the middle class can have this. No, part of what would be. Well, not only get right, gardening, but, but let's get to the next how step. How many of those four people live in on a right. place they can garden? What we need to do is have a farmer's market within two miles of everybody and have it, if you can't grow your own, you'll grow local.
We have to find Local a way board. to spread this across the That's board right. because it doesn't it's, work it's, any other I way. I can answer the question because yeah. I'm part of that lower section. So am I. That's why I want to know. <laughs> uh, it's, it's growing, if eating foods that are whole foods instead of processed foods, if I yeah. processed foods, do you want to eat well? You buy whole food that was actually a fruit or a vegetable to begin with and then cook it and make it, make everything yourself. Don't buy anything processed. I do. And but I can't afford the, the apple compared to the crappy apple. Where are you shopping? Uh, at, um, uh, not Sun Whole Foods, Sun, Sun Harvest. Harvest and H-E-B. You just can't do it. I, you I can't, you can't buy bread I, for four little kids that is Five dollars. Right. Well, it's you know, my, <coughs> you make your own. It's a lot cheaper. I buy whole ingredients to make everything. And I, my shopping, um, I go to a little place called South Laredo Street. It's called Chico Boy. It's all produce lane. It's a vegetable stand. It's mm -hmm. food market. Yeah. Um, use vinegar wash to wash all your food. <coughs> well, we talk about that too. We right? do. We do. I do all these stuff. things, but <coughs> you know, you say it's still board. tough. It's it really is. tough for a lot of people. And yeah, they, they don't people. have the resources <laughs> to grow it's their own. They well, I think that the, the bigger the picture is, and I agree with y'all, uh, we've allowed this to happen to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are all complacent. Uh, I'm still lazy sometimes. Stop and get a taco. I don't do it very often. Bruce, can I add one thing? Sure. It used to be the Bear Land Trust. Their name is now Green Spaces Alliance. They have money available. They have funding available to help people set up community gardens. You can go uh, community supported agriculture, community gardens. Uh, Linda Harberger is very big into this and go to the Green Space Alliance website and they have had quite a number of seminars and things like that teaching people how to start community gardens and they have money available to help any neighborhood anywhere start community gardens. And even people who live in projects and things like that Plow up that uh, yard area one time. I mean, we got to get to no till, but you got to plow it once to get it softened up. I'd, I'd strongly suggest you uh, get with, uh, and like I say, today it's called Green Space Alliance instead of Bayer Land Trust, and find out some of the programs that they have available and some of the good support they have available to help you move in the right direction. We're a long way from ever seeing it happen, but you know. I understand we need to. Every person has to make their bid to help the situation. But it does seem rather far away for so many people. Well, but all I'm saying is there is help out there. You better go people a step at a time. Want to go to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, you said I, I love Italian food. I make a lot of uh, yeah. pastas and red sauces are good organics. Right. But it's our canned organic tomatoes. It's really bad. I've been uh, buying the Glen Muir organics. is a pretty good brand. Glen Muir? Glen Muir. And the reason I like Glen Muir is they've announced. Right. Well, I say they've announced that they will no longer use BPA line can. So, not in addition to being certified organic and very reasonable if you bought Glen Muir. Is there a chemical process when they peel the tomatoes? No, like that's steamed. No, I think that's steamed and rolled. Yeah. What's the brand name? Glenn Muir, M-U-I-R. The only reason I brought them up specifically is, again, I read that they've made a commitment to get completely out of the BPA business. Bruce, change. Oh, uh, no, no, you can talk as long as you want, but you've got other places to go. But you were talking about learning to learn more about biofuels and things mm -hmm. like that. You probably already know that Medina, the folks that make so much of what we sell, Stewart is making his own biodiesel there at Medina. and. Cool. He's running into a problem because it's gotten so popular. I mean, he provides containers to the different restaurants around and places to get the grease. People are going through and stealing his grease to make their own biodiesel now. So uh, I tell you, you got to learn to make biodiesel out of ducks and you'll have it made. Boy, can I? Actually, you know, let's do that and then I'll get off this. The newest biodiesel idea that just is, and not just, but is really getting to have some, uh, some teeth is algae. They've just found a new algae that is way more efficient. Uh, and then we've been using it. And, and uh, this guy claims, he's a Frenchman, but he's in here in the States. He claims he can do 100,000 gallons an acre. Now, it sounds impossible, doesn't it? But let me tell you how he's doing it. Fresh water or salt water algae? Uh, it's fresh water. And let me tell you how he's doing it. And, and this is visionary now. I say doing it. He's experimenting with it. He's going to go vertical. All he needs is light and algae and water. And instead of taking an acre and putting a pond out there, 
he takes an acre and he builds two-story or three-story, three or four hundred of these things that are only this wide, and they all uh, are uh, oriented towards the sun all the time. So I won't get into all the details. But we are going to do different things to protect ourselves and fuel amazingly fast when our government will get behind us like the European governments have gotten behind them, like the Japanese governments have gotten behind them, the Swiss, the German. We just canceled our, our monies to subsidies for solar and wind power, and they're not getting redone right now. They, they did not approach this right now. And, and that's going to kill people like, now I hate to say there's a capitalist I like, but I do, T. Boone Pickens has just committed 10 billion bucks for wind power, and he says, I'm not doing it if I'm not going to, he says, I'm doing this to make money. you gotta, you got to admit, T. Boone, for, you got to appreciate one thing. He says, I'm doing this for money. I am a capitalist. It just so happens I think green is better. Okay, I think wind is better. Uh, he owns more water rights in the state of Texas than anybody right now. He's a business, businessman. But we, we take guys like him out of that business. The estimate is if we don't renew just the wind power side of it, we're going to lose 116,000 jobs just in that one industry. One. We are not backing our people to get this. We're saying we want to go green. We want to go bio. We want to get off the government, the, the petroleum bandwagon. I have a better word I love to use, but I can't. But... Uh, but we're not making any effort as a government to help ourselves do that. And I don't understand, well, I do understand why. This, the good news is, no matter who gets elected, I'm not going to be political, it's going to be a big jump forward for us, for at least the green side of life. Mm -hmm. okay. Did CPS just buy a wind farm and down yes. their corpus or something? Yeah, and you can buy, you can buy into the wind, you know. You oh, spend about a little bit more on your, on yeah. your bill. And, and you are supporting the, the, the wind. And I, there's, nothing's perfect, folks. I don't know how many thousands of birds they've been killing with the windmills. They're learning, I was going to say, how many they were killing. Now they fast. now know they've got brakes on them, they've got electric, they've done a lot. They, of course, have learned not to put the windmills in flyways. <laughs> Duh. Mm -hmm. you know, but at first, you put them wherever the wind was. Now, I don't know that I like it. I kind of am fascinated when I drive out west and see it. I don't know if I wanted to live with one over my house. But if the, anybody's interested in that, Bruce, for Bert's husband, since he's retired now, yeah. he and a couple of friends, they take tours, free of charge, Go all the time. They'll put them on a bus and take you That'll out. That would be cool. Well, you know, what, it's you, absolutely know what, fascinating. you know what NIMBY is, folks? <laughs> NIMBY uh, means not in my, my backyard. backyard. That's part of the problem with wind right now. <clears throat> Everybody's a NIMBY. I want it, and I want you to do it. Don't put it right here. I'm going to get paid for, for it. They put a farm out. I yeah. mapped it. I know. Yeah. Uh, she asked a while ago, let me do this a while, kind of, I mean, I'll stay as long as you want, but I don't want to, to bore you all to death. Uh, she asked you me something about cleansing things. Yeah. Uh, vinegar kills 99% of everything that gets around in the way of bacteria and bugs. Vinegar. Because it's not registered with EPA as a pesticide, and there's a lot of this, here we go again, with, you know, if you want to uh, screw something up, get the government involved. So they can't tell you, you can't write on it, this is a pesticide. But if you'll take your fruit... And, and if I can even give you a mix if you want, the perfect thing, and this is from university, it's not from me. You get a bottle of peroxide, and you get a bottle of vinegar. And they don't care which order you put it in. On your cutting boards, on your countertops, on your fruits and vegetables, you spray one and then the other immediately. Now, why aren't you doing both in one jar? Because it makes some kind of acid that's noxious as hell to you to breathe. Whatever all that chemistry is. But as soon as that one hits and oxidizes or the other one, then you spray it. It's basically such a little amount of that gas that you don't smell it, feel it, see it, hear it. It is a sterile, actually it did in the studies they did a better job than the famous Lysol. Without yet all those names you can't say. And you can eat it. I'm just using, well there's a good time. Everything on earth I do with vinegar, I do with apple cider vinegar, except this. Why? I buy white vinegar. 5%, 9%? Yeah, 5%. Yeah, 5%. Cheapest thing I can find. You can buy peroxide for 39 cents. Folks, yeah, I gargle with peroxide. It won't hurt you. I wouldn't drink a bunch of it. Then do you yeah. rinse it off? You, you know, I, if you want, you should. I, I do it this way. Sometimes I spray the, the, the peroxide and then the vinegar. Vinegar's okay. Explains why you foam at the mouth now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've seen that I drink some baking soda. <laughs> but 
while we're on there, one part baking soda, two parts, I mean, no, one part vinegar, two parts baking soda. When you initially put the baking soda in and pour the vinegar on it, it's going to fizz. Just let it fizz first. Put this in a bottle or a jar. I use a glass jar. And uh, if you don't like vinegar smell, add a drop or two of an essential oil. I mean, uh, orange oil, which I like because it also has other things it'll do, and you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. You can use anything just to get rid of that pungent vinegar, which I like, but some people don't. When it quits fizzing, put the jar and shake a little bit, get it all mixed up real good. You will not have a more effective, better, easier to use scrubbing powder for pennies in any Bon Ami and anything you can buy on Earth. You've got enough abrasiveness there with that baking powder, it's sterile, it won't hurt you. Uh, you can put it in an oven and heat it up, and it really helps remove the grease if you'd like to. Uh, and you make as much as you need at a time. I guess you could store it. I don't know why you would. But it's a scouring powder. So now you've got a sanitizer, a really good antibacterial. You've got a scouring powder. If you want to make soap that'll work, or soaps that work very well, uh, buy washing soda, which is probably sodium carbonate, not bicarbonate. Uh, use it as part of your liquid and uh, your uh, clothes washing. Uh, don't put bleach in it, please, not chlorinated bleach. Some of the oxy bleaches are evidently pretty safe, but I did kill some ducks with it. I used some, I gave my wife some, she was finally fussing because all we'd ever use is peroxide for our bleach. And she wanted something a little more immediate. The peroxide works very slowly, you let it soak. Uh, and she, we run all of our, all of our water goes back out to water our plants. None of our water, well, we have composting toilets. So we don't have any water that we have either washed in, washed the vegetable in, or washed clothes in. So all my water goes back out on the ground. And I found two or three dead ducks, right, where this oxy bleach or whatever is one else. I no longer use it. I don't know it's dangerous other than that, but I wouldn't do that. But there's your clothes cleaning. Very easy to do. I get, maybe if you want to ask, I can't think of anything we can't clean with the few things we use as clean or cleaner than we did <coughs> when we bought all these, and I want to use the word poisons because what brought this whole idea up is, the poisons that we use, the cleansers and deodorizers in our home, make our homes, even in big cities, more polluted and more dangerous than being outside in the air. And most of them are petroleum based. Very, almost all are petroleum based, which means it contributes. Do you know we use having lots of green plants inside helps take a lot of that out of the air. More than, there's some that are even well known for. Some of the air plants and things take a tremendous amount out for the volume that the plant is. How to Grow Fresh Air. It's a book in the San Antonio yes. Library. There's three or four copies and uh, still circulating. If you want to have your own, they're on the shelf up in front. These two former nice research Yes, yeah. that's the one. Great book. Any particular questions? Uh -oh. Yes. I, I use a dishwasher. I know you don't mm -hmm. use one. Is there a natural formula for a... Uh... Actually, there is. Seventh Generation has come out with a uh, formula for dishwashers. Any homemade? Well, we never owned one. Uh, Be careful no, making I something about for home use in a dishwasher, yeah. because if it's intended for foaming like it would in a sink, you're going to end up with uh, yeah. a wonderful yeah. job cleaning your... Well, you know, uh, anybody use Dr. Tired. Bronner's soap besides me? Yeah. Dr. Bronner's is pretty low sudsing. I would experiment with probably a Dr. Bronner's and a washing powder, okay. washing soda mix. I have not done it. You're right. I, I'm still convinced, even though I read this big thing in some Plenty magazine or something, that... The current dishwashers use less water than me to wash dishes. Bull. There's no way they can use less. There's one bowl, and I do all my dishes, I set them aside, I get that one half gallon bowl again, and I rinse them all with vinegar water, which makes them completely spotless, and I set them aside. I've used a gallon, maybe. In no way a dishwasher is going to use a gallon and wash those dishes. So I disagree with them. They're trying to sell us a dishwasher. Yes. Okay. No? Yes, ma'am. Have an excuse. Um, back to the pots and pans and dishes sure. and things. So much is made in China now. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a swipe test or some way that you can tell whether or not the stainless steel pot that you're cooking in has some other kind, type of metal in it? That there are some tests for some chromiums and things, but the problem is there's so damn many things that can be in there. <laughs> You'd have to have a chemical lab. What you need to do is either go on the web and see what's been tested, number one, number two. In this case, I, I, I'm pretty bad about saying I don't want to buy a name brand because you're getting bad. But in this case, some of the 1018 stainlesses by Tramontina, and some of them have been tested, and we know they're good and pure. Uh, like, like Crusades enamels have been tested, whereas some of the other enamel pieces haven't. 
I opt there to spend a little more or again just stick with my cast iron. I did have to get uh, stainless for my wife because she uh, weighs 110 pounds soaking wet and she can't handle a 12 pound skillet on a regular basis. You know, uh, so Lowe's, was here Lowe's sells a, a kit to test for lead. I, I knew that, yes sir. Yeah, I, Good. I, I, lead I, and there's again. I wanted to hear you talk about uh, stevia. I've yes. had uh, read some recently about that it might possibly be right, bad for you. But I've been using it probably for eight or ten years. Let, let me give you my. I have read that think, a dozen times. You think the sugar industry might be? Uh, I don't think I know. Oh, okay. From what we've looked back, a number of these go to Swopes. If you've not been to Swopes, and a number of these things you hear about stevia uh, uh, being dangerous. They've been using it for a thousand years. Right. And, and it's uh, uh, raw balini, I think, or something stevia. It's a stevioid. It is a all plant product. Some of the question was when you concentrated what it did, and they did some tests, or at least they supposedly did tests where they literally fed a pound and a half a day to a rat, and he had some problems. But, yeah, I'll give you a pound and a half of Coca-Cola and a rat, and you'll have some problems. Too. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, there's a limit to how that works. I am just like you, sir. I would opt for every one of you in here to not use any artificial sweetener unless you use stevia. There are a couple others out there, xylitol. Seems to be pretty safe. I don't like They're it. Making They're making xylitol out of corn now. It used to be made out of birds. But that's right. No, that's right. You can't get corn back. That's right. You got to make sure you got. It doesn't taste sweet anymore either. And there's a new one. I don't even know what it is yet. But you are right there. It's hell on on animals, yeah. cats and dogs. So be careful if you have xylitol. I just say Stevie. I carry mine with me. This is like my underwear. It's on me most of the time. Like guava neck. Most of the time. <laughs> and, and, and I just have it whenever I go somewhere because I do like the sweet. Do you know anything about Splenda? Splenda, yeah, I don't use it. Uh, it breaks down into a full use. And it's not as bad as aspartame, I don't think, but it's close. Yeah, Splenda's not good. And you're going to find that. That's these sciences, man, yes, I have, have you seen? Are. Have you seen the commercial about high fructose corn syrup? I heard about it. Oh, yes. I thought the one was going to start on this tirade about how bad it was. Oh, no, no. It's being paid for by the uh, corn industry. It was unbelievable. Yeah. They're pro-fructose corn syrup. It's good for you, then. What is evaporated cane sugar? Is that just, plain just what it sounds like, yeah. It's just white sugar? It's, it's, it shouldn't be white. Oh, I mean, is it should better? be brown. <laughs> yeah, what you should look for, if you're going to eat real sugar, I'm not anti-real sugar. I'm anti-refined white sugar, but turbinado, all they did was evaporate the water off of the cane sugar and put it in a box. Now, don't get brown sugar. These ones that say, look, they call raw sugar. You know what they did with that? It was cheaper to make it white and then dye it with a little bit of brown molasses oh, coloring than it was to leave the stuff alone. So it's not real molasses, it's molasses coloring? Well, I, we don't know, because they don't have to tell us. Ooh. Turbinado costs a little more, but if you like real sugar, and I especially cook with real sugar, I mean, I think if you have a real weight problem, you got to watch all your calories intake. But if you just need sugar, uh, that kind of sugar, and the quantity, here we go again, you can't eat two cups a day. Honey. Honey's wonderful. And that molasses is really better for you. If you like the flavor. I've been doing some chicken foods. What do you feed your chickens? And any chicken breeds you recommend for San Antonio? First, you're going to hate this. I don't feed much. Okay, just. I feed them a pound or so at a time. I buy an organic chicken food. The one place I know now, but I understand you can get a lot of places, is uh, there's a feed store in, in Austin, Texas. It's $27 for 50 pounds. It's a lot. I feed them a pound a day or so, and that's for a bunch of birds to keep them coming to me, and and then they get all my garbage. I don't have. I, we used to talk about how much I composted. I don't even think to compost anymore. A duck is a pig with with wings. <laughs> They'll eat anything. I, I bought myself a. Uh, uh, I always use this one wrong. I use incinerator. That means I burn it up. A sinkerator. What do you call those things that everybody Disposal. uses? Disposal. Thank you. See, I never had one of those because I didn't dispose of much. But I bought one and I put it in my outdoor sink. And instead of putting it in water, I put a bucket under it. And when I've got orange peels, avocado peels, uh, chicken bones, uh, anything I couldn't eat at all, I just grind it. I run it through there with some water. I have a bucket with a bunch of holes in the bottom. The water drains away. I get two, three, four, five pounds. And when I kill a deer, I got 30 pounds of food. And I grind it all, and I put it out there, and they just 
there isn't a, there isn't a stitch left in 30 minutes. <laughs> Nothing. I don't care what it is. Things I thought animals couldn't eat. Banana peels. They, you know, a duck will eat anything. As a matter of fact, I killed two last week. You know why? You know what else ducks eat? Ducks. Aww. They're eating all my baby ducks. The big male drakes, when they get bigger, I guess they get where they're not so mobile. So they have to start working a little harder. And they wait, and they get with the crowd, and all my guys are getting together. And I saw this. This is how I know. All at once, I hear the distressed duck call. <laughs> And he's got this duck by the head, beating it on the ground. Oh my God. And he swallows a duck first bigger than you think. You must think a little duck's throat, I mean a drake would be this big around. I think they could swallow a baseball. He swallowed the duck whole. That's when my little laser gun came into play. <laughs> Bruce, back to Mark's question. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Is there so many varieties of chickens? Yes, I, the first time I got chickens, I killed most of them. I got a thing called a Cornish Cross White. That's the normal, highly domesticized, worth thing. It's a chicken God would have never made. There's no doubt in my mind. That, it's, it's, a, it's a a human chicken. At 14 weeks, they drop dead. Well, I'm giving you a round number. Because their heart can't support their bodies. They've inbred them so much that their chests are so big and the body volume is so great, the little heart can't carry them. So the only way you can raise them is what? In a little cage where they sit there until you eat them in 14 weeks. Don't get that bird. I'm using New Hampshire Reds, Rhode Island Reds. Uh, I got some Brahma. You know what a Brahma is? He's big enough to eat a small dog. Uh, most of what happened to mine, I can, as a matter of fact, I have pictures with me. It's embarrassing. I have my nano with ducks in it. And uh, mine have been bred now and crossbred. So I, I truly have third world chickens, if you know what I mean by that. The guys that weren't successful are gone. They make them. Because remember, I don't predator control either. I have one dog named Secret. Okay, I have a vulture. For real. Uh, and three cats. My cats don't touch any of my birds. Even my parrot, that's out free if you get to see my website. And my vulture is mostly there for scare. But my Secret is Secret. He patrols all night. He's taken up that the ducks and the chickens are his, kind of like, yes, sheep dogs do sheep and lamb. And you don't mess with his birds. Now, I still lose some to predators. You know who I lose? The stupid birds. <laughs> and I don't want those stupid birds in my system. I don't want to protect a stupid bird. I mean, we've done this. I learned this from a, in another side. I was over in Europe. And, and I, they have more ravens there per square foot than we've ever had. And they don't ever lose a lamb. Here, we shoot ravens because they eat baby lambs. That's how I've raised 13 ravens, and every one of them came where they've shot the adults, and the game warden knew that I was stupid enough to raise ravens, so he, I would go get the ravens. I was talking to this guy that raises his sheep, and it's the same thing. We've dumbed our sheep down so that they won't protect their babies. They just lay there and let the pig eat them, wild pigs eat them. They lay there and let the vulture carry them off. They lay there and let the raven take them away. This guy that I was talking to uh, in, in Britain when I was there, said that mama has that kid or whatever you want to have if it's a goat. And she's literally back on her feet 90 seconds or whatever the number is. You better not come up and mess with the baby. Maybe not even you, but certainly a dog or a raven or a, or a vulture. They just don't allow it to happen. Anybody else been around an Angora goat? They're hardly smart enough to get up, which less protect the babies. We dumbed them down. They should have gotten eaten by a fox. Bruce, one more thing. Yeah. Back to your question, I don't know how much land you have to do it on, yeah. but um, and I imagine you can find it on the web. Look up Chicken Tractor. Yeah. There Good is one. a guy raising chickens and has to keep them caged, but he has this cage built that he could hook his tractor onto, and he literally lets it sit in one place until the chickens have eaten most of the greens and the insects, and then he hooks it to the tractor and drives it 50 feet and just literally drags it around the pasture. I did, my, I did my chicken. show from his farm last year. Yeah. Joe South. And he's obviously he's got good fertilization going on for the grass and stuff under <coughs> yeah, Well, let me finish the story. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He actually gets 50 cows and puts them on a half acre for a day. Think about it. They totally devastate. There's crap everywhere. The next, mm -hmm. he waits three days, and when the maggots start coming out of the manure, he puts the tractor there. Chicken tractor. The chicken tractor. They eat all the maggots. He has no flies to speak of. They disassembled the manure piles looking for maggots and totally fertilized the property. 
He does this in areas so that he goes time, 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 so I'll give you a number, I don't know. He doesn't get the cattle or the chickens back there for like 60 days. The fertilizer's in, the grass is regrown. He's his own best fertilizer. You want to know how he feeds pigs? You're going to hate this. He has to have cows in all winter. You know the story? He has cows in, in, in little pens like we used to do in the old days, and he feeds them on hay because there's no... He's in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, 100 miles out of D.C. My daughter's in his CSF. That's how I got to meet him. So I keep this cow in here, and then every day or two when it gets messy, you ever had a cow in a pen? Talk about crap. He throws in a half a bale of hay and about a gallon of corn. And he does this from like November to March. Now, when the cow is down here, you can now look and the cow's up here. <clears throat> this stuff's three or four feet deep. He takes the cows, puts them back on pasture in March, and puts the pigs in all these pens. They completely disassemble this thing looking for the fermented corn. They stay in there a couple of weeks in each one. They eat all the corn. They crap and take all this hay moving around, and he's his own compost. He's made his own compost with pig. <laughs> then he sells the pigs. Smart. That sounds very good, but that's they're perfect. There's no E. coli. There's no violent thing. It's, it's is that cool? Now, the only thing I don't like about Joel is because you're going. He's going to speak here in February. If y'all want to go to the Tafka, he's our guest speaker this year. Uh, Where's Tafka going to be this year? Yeah, unfortunately, it's going to be in Colleen, so it's not real close. But it's worth going. It's the best meeting in the state. Uh, the only thing I didn't like about Joel, and, and he and I had a, I won't use the word fight, we were drinking beer, we weren't fighting that bad. Um, he kills every predator on earth. That's not sustainable living with nature. He's been fined for shooting hawks. He kills every coon, every possum, everything that lives on that land is only for his purposes. And I don't think that's living with nature. And I bothered him. And I said, why? Because your chickens are in tractors. And the answer, without being too crass, with a few verbs missing, is, I don't like them. He hates hawks. He hates chick I mean, uh, possums. He hates raccoons. He hates foxes. His neighbors have actually, again, had him uh, arrested for shooting the hawks. So even though he's a great nature man, he's the best racer of things I've seen to be at a place to make it work. I find that pretty rough. I mean, if you've got, a, if you've got an animal that's really bothering you and you have to eliminate an animal, Foxes have learned where the chickens are, and you have no way to, okay, that's part of living. But to kill everything, to word, I use the word annihilate, just because it exists there is a little bit troublesome to me. It's almost, I mean, no other animal does that. So anyway, Joel's going to be here. He's a good guy in a lot of ways, but it's bothered me that he, not only does he do it, he brags about it. That's what makes it worse. He kind of likes it. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sure. It's time again. <laughs> You talked about the tea that you make, or mm -hmm. in using cayenne and cinnamon mm -hmm. and things of that sort. How do you get them into solution? I've tried using mm -hmm. the cinnamon, and it just all floats on the top of liquid. How do you... Well, actually, mine ends up mostly on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you what I do, is and it does help. Or, or well, yeah, first what I do is I, I do use my own deer broth, and I put about that much in the bottom of the cup. I put all my goodies in there, whatever I'm doing. I do experiment, believe me. I just get in the herbs, you know, some of it doesn't work. Kelp stinks. <laughs> I have these kelp things and they just get bitter when you're cooking. They're awful, even though if kelp's good for you, don't put it in your tea. But I, boil, I bring water to a complete boil and I pour it directly in there. And as soon as I do, I really mix it in well. I really get it. And a few things do float. Most of it, unfortunately, goes the other way. When you get to the very bottom, you got this one last drink that's got a real punch to it. <laughs> okay? But, but the good thing is it flavors it just enough. The only other thing I use, I'm not anti-salt, folks. I happen to use a really, really um, interesting Redmond sea salt. And I do salt it. That's the one thing I put a little salt in. I do find it. It's consomme. If you've ever drank, it tastes like consomme soup. And I do use a lot of different things. But it, mine stays pretty good. Mine, again, is more on the bottom than the top. Mix it together and then pour in boiling water. Real hot, well, whatever hot it is, 212 degrees, <laughs> I won't get beyond boiling. But yes, it, that'll seem to settle it in, especially the cayenne, definitely goes down. I use pure turmeric, it definitely goes down. Most of the stuff will, will be, you'll find very, very e easy to do. The good news is, Bruce has promised to come back and do this next spring again. He's yeah. got to go cook a Fredericksburg. He's going to be broadcasting his show next spring. And I appreciate you coming over. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>